Counselor Accents Podcast. Two school counselors who love their jobs. Oh, and they happen to have Southern accents too. Bless their hearts. I'm Laura Rancourt. And I've got gum in my mouth. Sorry. I'm Kim <laughs> Crumbly, and together we are Counselor Accents. I've got us some great guests today, Kim. Take all the credit, please. I, I will. You know that SEL is more important than it's ever been. Absolutely. Just everything that our students are coming back to school with. And, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about um, SEL and just how our students, how we perceive that they're feeling and then how they're actually feeling. And we have two SEL gurus. Um, I don't know. What would we want to call them besides guru? Is there anything better than a guru? Kings um, of I, I work 25 years in public education. I've never been called anything close. <laughs> well, today's your day. You overshot with guru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You started here and worked up to here. We have Greg Benner and Eric Bowles with us. And um, guys, just take it away. Introduce yourselves. Greg, why don't we start with you? Oh, I'm Greg Benner. Um, First of all, thank you so much, uh, Laura and Kim, very much for being on here today. Um, I love counselors very much. I've I've, I've been doing this a long time. I I do a lot of uh, implementation work with, with lots of school districts. I have a model called the Whole Child Initiative, uh, which kind of was developed in the the city of Tacoma, Washington. And uh, but counselors are really at the core of it all. And uh, especially when it comes down to differentiating SEL to youth needs, which is at the heart of equity, uh, in my view, is that you get what you need. And so I'm really excited to be here with you today. And I'm a professor at the University of Alabama. And uh, but for 15 years before this, I was at the University of Washington. And so I'm just thrilled to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Well, and I would just say likewise. I'm uh, my name is Eric Bulls. I work for a small organization in the Pacific Northwest it's called the Center for Educational Effectiveness. Uh, we're a research and survey firm, primarily in the uh, education sector. Um, and I was a longtime consumer in my 25 years in public education. I'm a recent retiree. Uh, And so one of the things that interested me about our work uh, at the Center for Educational Effectiveness, we we go by CEE, so I'll shorten that up so I don't have to get all those syllables out there, was we provide world-class data arrays for school systems. Uh, We didn't provide any kind of uh, support. So it's very clear from the information that we convey to school systems, really what they need to be doing next. And yet when they would ask us, well, so can you help with that? Our answer was, well, we, we measure, but no, we can't help with that. So Greg and I had worked together in the state of Washington off and on for about 15 different 15 years in some different capacities. Um, and, and so my vision when I joined the company was we also want to be more than a research and survey firm. We want to be a professional development firm. We want to get the best of uh, information in the hands of educators so that our survey work makes ultimately a much bigger difference. So Greg is our first collaboration and he'll, he'll talk quite a bit more about the work that we've done around uh, what we're referring to as the whole educator series. So that's, that's how the two of us uh, you know, came to be here. And uh, gosh, on behalf of both of us, just really grateful for the opportunity to be with you all. Well, we're glad to have you. And um, Kim, before you jumped on, I was telling them, Greg has come to our school system And I am seeing just the things that he talks about. I'm seeing them in action. And I can't even tell you how rewarding it is for me to watch this happen and how rewarding it must be for you, Greg, to to hear that these things are working. We're taking them. We're implementing them. And just I, I will tell you this. We talked this week about you can look at a student and think, yeah, they're doing really well. They are put together. They um, get along with others. And then some of the practices that you suggested when we put those into place, we get to see what's really underneath that uh, veneer because the students are sharing what's really going on. And, you know, we can measure teacher perception all day long, but what really matters is how the child is feeling. And and that's what you have helped us do. So I'm very grateful. 
And I'm very interested and I'm <laughs> jealous because he came to your school. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, I think, you know, just jumping in here, I think that's Eric mentioned a moment ago, that whole educator series. And that's a series of six modules where I, I love, honestly, my comfort zone, what I'm most comfortable doing is being in a library somewhere in an elementary school, high school, or in a, in a gymnasium, working with educators, training, coaching, sharing strategies. My heart is with teachers. My heart is with our specialists, counselors, with our youth, with our families. That's where my heart's at. I have this nice office here where I get to do my research and things. I'm very thankful for that. But my heart is always with, with our youth and those that serve our youth. And with Whole Educator, the whole intent there was to try and get some simple, doable, we call them kernels, some little simple, doable strategies that we put together. And I get to demonstrate those. And we have little video clips and things like that in that series to help educators see that it's what's possible. Mm -hmm. That These little tiny, simple things, they have such a large impact, small change, big gain. And uh, so that I really, you know, so I guess what I'm trying to say, Kim, is that you, you can work, we can work together 24 seven on demand anytime through, the, through that resource, of course. And that's even better sometimes than me coming to visit a school because they can watch me over and over and over again and really you know, focus in on a practice and, and work on it together to the point of mastery and fluency. And uh, so, but not to say, Kim, I'd love to come visit you, by the way. Let's, let's do that sometime, but. Okay, yeah. I, I, as an as a educator who may be listening, just coming on, yeah. let's back up and get a little more uh, understanding of what, uh, what's going on here. So um, you're going into schools and this is um, when you say you're giving strategies, do you go in and you're doing data first and how does that work? How does the school, what is the process? I guess I'm asking. Oh, really good question. And um, well, I guess the process is when I, when I begin to work with a school or school system, um, and, and usually if I'm, I'm working in a, in a place like ARAB schools or another school district, we kind of start with, you know, why? Why am I there? You know, what's, what then educators get a lot of professional learning opportunities, conferences. There's a lot of online material, ways in which we can learn. Uh, but I kind of start with that. Is it why? The why of the work? And I think there's a, like three important whys that I try to highlight. Uh, with educators. And the first why is really about trauma, about adverse childhood experiences. And the pandemic itself is one ACE or trauma uh, that we're all experiencing. And, uh, you know, just this morning, I learned about a, a very close friend who just lost a brother to COVID. And it's just, there's heartbreak. We have in our hearts, or we have a lot of hurt and the world around us, there's hurt in our world too. And that impacts us in a really big way. Um, and adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, um, are you know very predictive of a person's health outcomes and educational outcomes, and they really lie at the root of a lot of personal challenges we face and a lot of societal challenges we face. So I, I kind of lay that out to educators, and they say, "Yeah, I see trauma in my class. I have more kids than ever who need help, and the behaviors I see seem to get more and more severe over time." And not only that, but as you know, when we talk with early childhood teachers, kindergarten teachers, they're shocked at what they see and their hearts are breaking. And uh, so I guess to answer your question, can we really start with that, the, the, that feeling that we're all feeling and what we're all seeing too, is we see trauma and, and we just maybe didn't get the preparation we needed during our teacher prep to really support youth and each other with the amount of trauma we're dealing with. And so that's what I do. I, I step in and say, look, let's, we're in this together. Let's link arms. Educators were often blamed for things. And I step in and say, this is no blame. This is let's work together. Let's solve problems together. And let's address this kind of enemy we have of ACEs and trauma. And can we prevent and mitigate trauma? Yes, we can. And we can do that. We can go on the offensive. And, and that's what I try and do is, uh, is, is teach simple, doable, evidence-based strategies that are high impact, that allow us to go on the offense against adverse childhood experiences. So we start with the why, I guess, to answer your question, why are we here? And then people get up in their heart. They say, look, I'm here and I'm learning about some new strategies and I want to do them. I want to do these new strategies. They create that, that want to or that desire, that belief inside themselves to look, I want, 
give me one more strategy. Give me another strategy because I want more because it has such an impact on me personally. My stress goes down. My burnout goes down. That exhaustion is starting to taper down. I feel more confident. My self-efficacy grows. I see more engagement with the youth I'm working with, just like we're seeing at your elementary school. And you, Laura can tell you, and that was just, what, about a month ago, I think we did some training on that. And so the impacts and with educators have been pretty immediate. We see real impacts quickly because they have the strategies they need that they didn't get during their teacher prep. And they're probably not going to get a lot of these strategies too at a lot of conferences we go to. Uh, and it sort of sifts through all that fluff that we get and like, let's get right down to it on stuff that works. So anyway, that was a long response, but, but that's what we start with is the why, because people don't change habits unless they want to. That's the bottom line, isn't it? And for anyone listening to this podcast, isn't that the truth? And old habits are hard to break too. And we won't adjust our habits unless we have a want to, a reason. And that aces in the importance of SEL to build uh, emotional intelligence in our youth. Those are skills for life. And then, of course, for us educators, we, we, need, we, need to, we need to give ourselves that gift of simple, doable strategies that will relieve that stress in our lives. So that, that's what I try and say is I, I got a gift for y'all. I'm showing up with a gift, you know, but you got to open up that box. And you got to put on what's in the box and wear it and try it on because it's going to lead to a lot of wonderful things in your life. You know, and I, I can say that with an honest heart. And that's not no joke. That's real. So. So I'm hearing rubber meets the road, Absolutely. which is exactly what teachers need. And I have never known of a more, um, I don't know, this, this, the time that we're in, I, I don't think that educators are, are turning their nose up, if you will, at these SEL ideas anymore, because we have reached the point where it is showing up in our academics. The behavior is we've got to have help. And uh, I'm seeing so much secondhand stress among the teachers that I'm working with, just that secondhand trauma. Uh, so, the, I, I, you know, it's, it's got to happen now. It's not like we've got to do something now. That secondhand trauma, Kim, just to jump in again there, that, that isn't that it's kind of a, it's a, it's a hubris, you know, that word hubris where you care so much and you love so much and you have such a big heart for the children and that you can, you can love them so much that you can experience some of those traumas that they're experiencing vicariously through them. And so you're, you're spot on. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's what I try to do is, well, how can we build in little simple strategies to, to relieve that trauma we're feeling and that stress yeah. we're feeling and, uh, and I, I just love seeing educators blossom. I love seeing them get their, I call it, get their swagger back, you know, yeah. somewhere yeah. along the way with all this experience and the COVID and the trauma and the hurt and all this, we just sometimes lose that confidence, that, that swagger. And yeah. I just, I have a lot of joy when I, when I get emails and texts or even hear from Laura, like, Hey, we're doing this and we're seeing it and it's working. It's not a joke. We're seeing results. And and that, that brings me joy. You know, um, I have a great job and I get a nice little paycheck, but that's not, that's my joy is just what I just heard from Laura. Like, and I get to hear that every day. I get little feedback and it's like, thank you. Thank you. And it's like, that makes me feel good. So. I love that word swagger. That's a great, <laughs> that's great. Cause I know I picked, that was a word picture that I can, I can visible. I, I've been there on both ends of it. So I, that's a great word picture. And yes, to have anything that builds our confidence. And I think tools do that and knowledge. So Eric, are you the data side of this? That That's a perfect question because I was just sitting here thinking in my mind. So kind of what was the journey for me to get back together with Greg, you know, now kind of almost a whole continent away. Um, so in my last four years as an assistant superintendent here in Southeastern Washington State school system of about 20,000 students, um, the organization that I work for now, we've been a longtime partner with Pasco School District where, where I retired. And um, in our bread and butter survey, we have a section called the Student SEL Supplement. Uh, and it's been around a little a little while. We try to stay ahead of trends in terms of what we're surveying. So as I started to look at the data, um, what we see as educators, I tell you what, I never took so many pictures of torn up classrooms that I took in my last two or three years of my career. Um, what we see in terms of 
of that trauma manifesting as educators was showing up in that student self-report. Um, our our uh, constructs are all based around uh, Castle and some other uh, SEL frameworks. And we were seeing students uh, around grit, hopefulness, self-efficacy. We were seeing those trends just starting to fall off the table. Um, and it really got me thinking, gosh, we're seeing this as educators anecdotally. Um, we're now seeing it quantified in the student self-perception data. So really the next thing we need to do is we need to get a hold of the best people we know and get really practical tools in the hands of educators. So I started with a principal in another district and said, hey, I know this guy down in Alabama that's going to be perfect for this, uh, for this work. And the whole thing just kind of fell together. That is amazing. That, what a great partnership. Um, let's see, Greg, you went to every school in our school system. And when you came to our school, um, this was the thing, Kim, he gave us what we do call rubber meets the road, practical things. It was not overwhelming. We all understand the why, because like you said, Kim, we see it. Everybody sees it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this message that we've been preaching, um, now we have, I mean, I know we just called our last episode bite size nuggets, but that really is what you gave us, Greg. You gave us. No, the- and he said kernels. Please do okay. not <laughs> veer from kernels. <laughs> you gave us kernels. And, you know, a lot of times we can stay in that planning stage. Like I plan to do this eventually, but it was so broken down and easy to implement that by day one because he came like maybe two days before we started classes. So by day one, teachers were ready. They knew what to do. They were empowered and they're doing it. And not only that, Kim, but you know that we've worked with a lot of programs before where the teachers will get this feedback from the students and then they don't know what to do with it. So they call us as the counselor and we're running to go put out fires and I, I just feel like this whole child program, it, like I said, it empowers the educator. It empowers the teacher because all of a sudden she knows how to get the information and she or he knows what to do with it, really. It's exciting for a school counselor to think that it's the teachers getting the tools. Yes. Because we can't do it all, nor do we need to do it all. We're not with the students all day, every day. So that's exciting for me to hear that you're talking about it's in the hands of the teachers. Yes. And it allows me to do my school counseling job. Yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot, uh, guys, about getting caught in that reactive wheel where we're not able to take the time to be proactive because a lot of times from day one, you get caught up in this putting out fires and this has totally changed that. So um, what trends are you guys seeing in the SEL world? No, I think that one of the, there's a couple of trends I think I'd like to highlight. I think one trend I'd like to, to, to highlight is that uh, the strategies, you know, we're using at, at your school and, and across the school system with ARAB schools, and they're just simple, doable strategies like doing check-ins, emotional, social, social, emotional check-ins with students a temperature check, if you will, of their emotions. Am I in the blue zone, yellow zone, a red zone, or a green zone? Just a check-in like that. And that's not just for our youth, it's for staff. But, but a little thing like a zone check, we call it, or emotion temperature check, that little kernel, that little simple thing can be applied in any setting. So that's a powerful concept to take something that works effectively for a teacher, like you were talking about, Laura, like a zone check like that, and apply it in an after-school program, in a summer learning program, across a whole school, in a whole school district, and then maybe even to bring it out further into home environments. And so I think that's a, that's a trend that I think we have to be, because I I know we, we do, we work so hard as counselors, we work so hard as educators, and um, wouldn't it be wonderful to have youth serving programs in our community and even families on the same page uh, with us and doing some of these little simple things. And I think now is a great moment for things like this, because I'm a, I'm a dad, I have four children and these little simple things make a difference in my home and they make a difference in the schools that I'm working with and in my children's schools. And, and, and if we can create that consistency, 
So maybe even from cradle to career that our youth are getting these little strategies across environments that creates consistency. It creates predictability. And I've been kind of, there is some literature on this um, that, that, you know, that can some call it quote, a behavioral vaccine where it can be applied like fluoride in the water across a whole community and be impactful. And that's something where I came from in Tacoma, Washington, that that's the model. It's a whole, whole school, whole community a model. And so they, they use these SEL kernels in that sense where we, we go community wide. And so all providers, uh, we try to get strategies into the, the hands of uh, families. Uh, and that's, that's big because that, that has a huge difference in the lives of children. So. Gosh, that's a, the most exciting thing uh, to think about because I think a lot of times as educators, we are band-aiding at school and I want to get dig deep. And that is my goal this year uh, to dig deep into the families and to say, how can we make changes now at that family level? And I know that is very difficult, but sometimes it's just not having the tools They're, You know, parents don't, if they're not in our world, they don't have these tools or, or even know that they're available and to share something practical for a parent to do it may be a parent meeting or a Zoom call with parents. Gosh, Laura, that's my brain is just going. I knew it. I want to hear about some of these tips. Are, are we there yet? Can I do that already, Laura? I'm just excited. Do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, and another simple one. I know that we a lot of us already do this. Is just simple, like warm welcomes. You know, greeting students by name. We see some viral videos out there of that, but and it's great that we see videos of this teacher, that teacher doing it. But if it's something that we do across our whole system, and we call it a four by four now, it's a you know four positive hellos uh, per student by four different caring adults per morning. We call it a four by four. And, you know, like right now it's football season and a lot of us will see football players hold up the four at the football game. We all know what that means because we, especially here in the South, we love our football, of course, we like the four. And so I want, I want all educators maybe on this podcast to think about that, that the four for us this year in the midst of a pandemic and, and social unrest and concerns and heavy hearts would be hold up our four and do a four by four, make sure every child is greeted by four caring adults uh, per morning. Uh, and, and if we can do that, and that starts with our bus drivers, by the way, and they're, they're heroes and they don't get enough credit. Absolutely. Uh, don't, you, don't you think? And often, you know, but having that bus driver greet a student by name, and that's the important thing is learn their names. Uh, you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. I know that's, that's clear. That's enough. You said the monkeys and then I moved it to the baby. <laughs> Here <laughs> that we are really showing our age. Yes, ma'am. So four by four. That's what I want to challenge everybody out there. If we can do that, I know that's a that's it's like you might be sitting there thinking, I already do that. Well, great. Now get the person next to you to do it. Now get your whole school to do that, and then get your whole district doing that. And what you'll create is a, a, a situation where youth are gonna it, they're gonna feel they're gonna feel peace. They're gonna feel connectedness. Uh, they're going to feel belonging, all that good stuff. Maslow's before bloom. We're going to start feeling Maslow's. We're going to fill those buckets and it's going to help us adults too, because we're going to have that, we're going to connect and it'll, it's, it's therapeutic uh, for everybody to do that. But you can do that across a whole community. It doesn't have to be only at a school. We can do that at after school programs. We can do that at summer programs. We can do that with social services. We can do that with our parks and rec department in our cities uh, our mayor, um, they're always looking for politicians are always looking to th for get, get behind things like that. And uh, this is a good moment for us to lead out and say, let's do some four by fours. Let's do some zone checks. These are not complicated things. And, um, you know. I could end on four by four. I'm so excited. <laughs> like <laughs> that is a movement that I can get behind. That's exciting. And I can see that how you want, as you said, be beneficial for the staff as well. What a morale booster, right? Making a difference practically, and we're all helping each other make a difference. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's what they're doing. It when I I've never been to a district that is doing this as well as as Laura's district, honestly. They and they just have it in their DNA almost that just this joyful place. And it's like, oh, that's a way for us to show the joy we have. We, we're joyful people now. It's a way for us to show it. You know, this four by four. That's a simple thing. Doing the zone checks. Uh, the other part of the four by four is end the day with a four by four. So po four positive goodbyes, 
uh, per student per day. And that's where a lot of us in schools can, can fall apart. We do great at welcoming, but then the end of the day can be pretty chaotic. You know, it can be yeah, a mad dash to, okay, are you on the bus? Are you here? We don't know. And it's confusing and it's a hustle bustle. And, you know, and, and that, that, you know, you know, so we, we encourage then a four by four at the end of the day and then take time at the end of the day to almost like a, like a closing circle. Like if some of us do classroom meeting beginning of the day or beginning of the class period, make time at the end of the day for let's close up, you know, Hey, I see that there's 10 minutes on the clock. Let's all circle up. Let's talk for a few minutes. How, how did our day go? Did you feel joy today? And then that teacher can also do that four by four to end the day, greet, say goodbye to each student by name as they exit. And then of course our bus drivers are going to be the last of that four to the, be the last one to say goodbye at the end of the day. So they're the first ones to say hello, the last ones to say goodbye. So we call that optimistic closure. And I think that's something that a lot of schools could do better. So a lot of us could do better. That is so good and such a difference. You know, it makes such a difference because we don't know what our students are going home to. And so in some ways, like you think we have this much time to combat what they see every day, every night when they get home or what they have to hear or whatever. And so we've got to make the most of it. And I mean, you guys know this. We all know this. They cannot learn if they don't feel those feelings of love and acceptance and welcoming and I and have safety and, and safety. safety. Yeah. And and uh you know I always say when we do our do you feel safe surveys that we're not these kids aren't answering to is there a fence around the school and SRO and extra door. They're answering to how are you treating me, teacher? Right. How are we how are we treating it? You know, are you belittling me? Are you how are you talking to me? all of these things. That's what safety means to these kids. So Eric, it seems like you brought on, you brought on the right guy because he does have an arsenal full of uh, kernels. <laughs> well, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that because I've been jotting notes as, as he's been talking. And when he talks about kernels, um, it was really my privilege and honor to write all the ancillary material, the presenters guides, uh, work with our creative, put the appendix together for the work. So I got to watch the videos way more times than I cared to, to be honest. And I was, I was taken, I was taken back by so many things. And I think, I think if you can't have Greg come in person, what's great about these videos is they feature almost 160 practical strategies. So when he says kernels, he's really talking about at least a whole era corn. It's more, more than kernels. Um, <laughs> The other thing that struck me was it speaks to educators K through 12. He was, very, he was very meticulous about making sure that strategies are included that might be deployed at the primary level uh, as well as at the secondary level. He talks a lot about implementation. So with your school counselor hat on or your principal hat on or your district administrator hat on, anybody watching the videos, uh, I think, comes away with something and some things is probably better said that they can do next. And then the thing I liked the most when I was putting the uh, presenters guides together was I put my principal, my old principal hat back on. I started as a principal last century. So when I say old principal hat, it really is an old principal hat. Um, I, you don't have to watch these in a sequential way. You can watch five or 10 minutes. You can, you can cross reference in the appendix and say, wow, I think we really want to explore these three strategies as a staff or as a third grade professional learning team. So they're just really incredibly versatile. And if you've ever had the opportunity to watch Greg present what he does, I think that's best in class is he gets that information out there, man, there's a lot of information in the words that Greg utilizes when he's speaking in front of groups. And it's like he's speaking to you, regardless of your role. You could be a paraeducator, a bus driver, an assistant superintendent, anything in between in the, in, in the mix that makes up a school system. And uh, Greg's speaking to you and he's doing it in a way that, that provides you, uh, th as you well know, Laura, things that you can use tomorrow. Yeah, I think that was the most exciting thing. It's <clears throat> It's just, it wasn't something that people had to go through some like huge training. You know, they didn't have to go through modules and pass a quiz to implement these things. They were just there and they could do it and they did it and it's working. And it's just, it really is amazing. So it's practical. That's awesome. I yeah. did a little keynote address 
uh, just about a week ago uh, in eastern Washington, in the middle, if you know our, our part of the world, in the middle of the wheat fields. I mean, I was literally off of a state route on this road, and all of a sudden I find this town. I've lived in Washington nearly my whole life, found found this town I had never been to about 45 miles from where I went to to, to university. Greg, Greg knows the area pretty well. So I'm with the entire, it's two cooperative school districts. And it's 70 staff. So I got the whole staff. I got the two principals, the superintendent, the bus drivers, the paraeducators, the food service staff. The, the district's run by 70 people. And we closed with just three of Greg's strategies. And let me tell you what, it, it really shored up the deficiencies that wa- was kind of the rest of the address and the earlier activities that, that was my material. Uh, and they were so excited to have, know that they had these three strategies and they were uh, – so we talked about warm, warm greetings, temperature checks, zones of regulation, and community circles. Uh, and they were so excited to see those strategies uh, implemented the way they were implemented on the video. They were like, what do we have to do to get more? And I said, the good news is your district has these for you. You can consume them on your own. You can consume them for uh, staff development. So it's just really a great way to close the uh, activity. And, you know, utilizing Greg's work ensured that I'll get to go back and, and, and work in that district. And what's so gratifying about it is, nobody's going to Endicott, Washington to provide professional development. And I think no matter where you work, you deserve access to this type of high quality resource. So it's, it's uh, so much fun to just be an evangelist for, for this great work. Where did the ideas for the strategies come from? I mean, who's like, where, where in your brain did you pull these things, these great ideas out of? I love creative people. That's interesting to me. Well, I'll tell you what, and um, I mean, I could, I could, I mean, what I've been real fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time researching and things, but I'll tell you the, the really the main source is, is you, it's you counselors on this uh, podcast. It's you educators. Um, and that's what my, my world is. I get to study implementation and, or improvement. How do we make improvements and, and to study that process. And so um, I will be honest, every, every time I get a chance to do a training and, and listen to educators, they teach me. That's the answer. You know, they're, they're teaching me, here's what we need. Here's what we're feeling. Here's what we don't have right now. Can you provide a solution to this? And we think it should look like this, the solution, if you did this, this, this. So to answer your question, these, these strategies or kernels have been refined over time and iterated and improved upon over and over and over again. And then the way they're rolled out, you know, to people is that, hey, look, and I give them a sort of a, like a menu. We all like a menu. Here's some options. And which of these, which I say fist to five, you know, which of these do you want to try on first? And so they choose, you know, they get to choose. And we honor teachers, which, which do you feel like you want to try on? And it's like, hey, we want to try on this strategy or that strategy first. And sometimes I have to slow them down because they want to do them all of them on Monday morning. Yeah. Uh, right. Cause we need all of them right now. So it's like, okay, let's try, let's try one and practice it a little bit and, and, and work with it. Uh, Cause we don't want, we don't want that to happen. Like throw the baby out with the bath where they, 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 they move too quickly to implement, but that's to answer your question is it's from educators, real, real world and, in high poverty places and places where there's major trauma and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of them were refined in Tacoma, Washington, where about 70% of youth low income and high domestic violence and crime rates and things, things have improved a lot in that city. Uh, and uh, so I know this is a podcast and what's, it's exciting to talk about these things, but these, these stuff, these things really do work and they've transformed that city in a big way to come a whole child initiative. And so I, I feel I'm real fortunate, real grateful. It's like you're, you're um, talking about Kim's school district. Every time we speak somewhere, Kim's poverty rate at her school grows. So really, we're unsure what it really is now because she- well, today it today it seventy six percent. Now I don't know poverty rate free and reduced, and that at, at, at my school, but the, I'm in a large district, so we do have a lot of generational poverty, and uh, but I what I see across every every area is that is growing, yes. and um, that's. That's why I'm excited about what can we also do to spread this news out into the families. And and I always say it takes, I call it a rope holder, someone to pull uh, this person out into a, uh, the light or a better way or out of their trauma or, or help uh, mitigate. And 
gosh, what a great opportunity ministry to actually put those easy to use because we're asking teachers to, we're not asking them to give up teaching academics. We've got to, you know, they have so much. I just feel like they have hats off to all teachers. I, I can't imagine um, their jobs are to get this academia, control behaviors, and now this. So we can't ask to do these intensive so I love, Laura, that you say it's do it. You get it and you can do it. And that's it. This is not just one more thing that they have to add to their plate. This is the tool so that they can do the right. thing. They yes. can do their yeah. thing. This is just the tool. It's, it's. I'm excited, Laura. You were telling the truth. I was. You weren't I was. exaggerating about no. Greg. <laughs> Thank you. So I have another question. Um what specific strategies do you find work the best with like older students, middle school and high school? I'd, I'd say, um, and I was going to mention this a, a minute ago about trends, because Kim, you kind of had a, a question about trends there. I, I'd say, um, you know, I'm just going to come out and lay this out, that a lot of us have a, a bad habit. And I say us being adults, I'm going to say, and that's, that includes us caregivers, parents, um, teachers, working with youth as coaches or in the community or whatever setting we're working with them where we, we have a, we power struggle, you know, we get into to, uh, discussions sometimes that escalate up and turn into a power struggle and, and ask any adult. And they'll, they'll say that, look, that's a, that's a source of stress. Yeah, you know, we get into arguments with my child, it escalates up. Uh, I say things I wish I wouldn't have said. I do things I wish I shouldn't have done. I make mistakes and I have, you know, there's regret and, and, and guilt sometimes that comes from that. Uh, but I, I, to answer your question, Laura, I'd say that, that, that addressing that head on uh, with all staff, I mean, elementary, early childhood, but especially middle, middle secondary, where when we get into patterns you know, day after day and class period after class period of power struggling with youth, uh, we can quickly get exhausted, burn out and, and want to be not teaching anymore. And you might be an educator with gifts. You might, you, you are, you, you it's not, not something you wanted to do when you came into the field is power struggle with youth, but inadvertently you've kind of developed this pattern because people like me at universities, we didn't do a very good job of equipping you with some simple strategies to avoid power struggles. So uh, we got to do a lot better at that. So I guess to answer your question, Laura, I'd say that that, that is a very important component. And, and when I start talking about it with middle secondary, they're, they're, you know, like the coaches that sit in the back and do this, they start perking up and they say, okay, what you got, you know, what, what talk, talk to me, talk to me about what you've got for power struggles. And, and I give them some simple strategies. Uh, one simple strategy is for the youth that you power struggle with most is to create a menu of youth leadership opportunities for that youth. And that's a, that's a total 180 in thinking where instead of pushing this kid out and excluding, we're going to pull them in and we're going to say, look, you know, you're a leader, you have charisma, choose a couple of things off this menu that where you can show your leadership for our school. Maybe it's being a greeter. Maybe it's being a team captain. Maybe it's leading our, our climate uh, committee for youth leadership committee for our school or a special project or being my co-teacher for this class or this class. There's a lot of ways youth can show leadership. And that's a very simple thing. And, and when high school staff hear that, they say, well, you know, that is actually the doable thing. I can, I can give that, that kid that I power struggle with opportunities to show leadership and they choose the ways they can show their leadership. I just got to create that menu and and that that's that does change the game and not for not only for that teacher and that staff, but but a lot of our youth that feel real marginalized, that feel real pushed away and real discouraged about school as a result. And it allows us to pull those youth back in, and say, no, 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 no. It's a new day, it's a new normal. We see the good in you, we see your strengths, and we want to use those strengths to make our school better. And 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 make that call home too about that. Hey, we see the good in your child. And that parent's going to say, are you serious? Like, this is the first positive call I've ever gotten. And they're going to be overjoyed. And uh, so that that's a simple one. And that really cuts stress in a big way uh, for us adults. So that's great. That's huge for so many. Uh, you're right, especially in the middle and high school when these kids want to save face 
and they don't have those negotiation skills that kids that come from homes where they've been taught those. And so it's just bring it and you're never going to win. You're never going to win. And, and so that is, that is a great practical strategy. It is. And Kim knows I say this all the time, but the word encourage means you put courage into. And that's what I hear whenever you're telling a student that may have never been encouraged, you know, just hearing derogatory statements his or her whole life. And all of a sudden you're saying, hey, you are a leader. You are putting courage into their heart. And just the transformation that can happen from that simple statement is huge to think about. And, and, it, uh, and I think our, our, our we um, people like myself that train teachers, we have not done a great job. We got to, we got to, we got to push forward now. And that's what I'm really trying hard. That's what this, this whole educator series, the whole bottom lines of we're trying to get these strategies out to people, you know, to use so that folks can have, have less stress, less exhaustion, less burnout. And, and even though like in a place like Endicott that maybe you haven't had a really great trainer come in for years and maybe never have that opportunity. You can now have that opportunity to get the support you need, but these little strategies will work and, and be really impactful. So, and that makes me really happy. If I can have an impact on teachers, uh, that's my job, that's my life. That's, that's it. So. Well, even the, the ones we have here gotten today, the, the, uh, what have we five or six we've gotten today, Huge game changers, just the ones that we, so I can't imagine getting the whole bucket of popcorn, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Those okay. curls can get popping. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I think, I think yeah. that's the other thing that uh, was really a great takeaway for me. And uh, where I worked in the past, we've had Greg come out in person many, many times. It's always a huge value to have uh, Greg in your school. But hey, what's so great about the videos is let's say we wanted to just rewatch that piece on, you know, engaging youth in that in that leadership role. Um, or you said our goal was to really implement, but 90 days in, you know, we all have goals and then things come up like COVID and best of intentions to be able to come back to what Greg had to say about that and look at it over and over again, or maybe just with a handful of folks that haven't quite caught up yet. Uh, it's just a really, uh, really versatile opportunity, I think. And versatile works in this day and age. Yeah, we need we need that. We need that versatility and flexibility. Flexible as a gymnast, we always say. <laughs> if you're in education, so Laura, you're going to be linking all this great information because I have a feeling that people are going to want to know more. I uh, hope that they do because it will be a game changer in your school. I can attest to that. So uh, guys, if they go to your website, um, effectiveness.org, then they'll find a treasure trove of resources. But especially if they go, if they put a forward slash workshops behind that, then they'll get some training. That That's exactly right. And uh, when you get in there, there's actually 18 minutes that come from module four. And those are the three strategies that uh, I mentioned earlier, where warm greetings, uh, temperature check zones of regulation and community circles. Uh, and, and I oftentimes just use that 18 uh, free minutes that, that we give away when I'm working with groups of folks, because I think it really, you know, my, my goal isn't so much just to sell it as to leave things behind, but People see the value inside of 18 minutes. They're like, wow, that was only 18 minutes of, of the six hours. And I've got three things that we can do right now. I mean, these aren't things that require master of pedagogy that a, a first year teacher could confront any of these things. And that was that was really, I think, our goal as well in, in the design. And this is all Greg's brainchild. So when I say our goal, I, I you know, I'm I'm a caddy. Greg's the Greg's the golfer. Um, but really, our goal was no matter how advanced your school is, I think this has relevance. If you're a high school, it has relevance. It has relevance as an elementary uh, in an elementary context. Uh, you can pick and choose the strategies that maybe you haven't layered on yet, even if you're way down the pike. And if you haven't started or you're just confronting uh, a model like uh, positive behavior interventions and supports like, you know, and 20 years ago would have been the best time to start. The next best time is today. Um, you've got some practical things that we're always looking for quick wins when we're trying to implement. And we've got some practical things that are going to be quick wins right away. Quick wins build that consensus, that buy-in, that momentum. And, and uh, I truly believe that this is going to help folks make an impact. 
I agree. And I was going to say too, if there's any any folks out there that would like to try and transform their whole district and their whole community, I know that's big thinking, but we're also partnering CEE and and ourselves as a team uh, on we kind of have a whole child model, a whole child partnership model, and if that's something that's of interest, that hey, look, we want to explore that, that we'd be happy to explore that with districts and communities that would like to put that fluoride in the water and transform the community, uh, make it better, improve the health of our people and educational outcomes. And we can go big too, I guess is what I'm saying. If y'all wanted to talk through that, any districts or leaders and communities out there, we're, we're ready to work with you. Well, I just wish this stuff would have been around. I just wish this stuff would have been around in 1995 when I was a teacher, I sure needed it. Yeah. Yeah. And even more so now, but you know, a lot of districts are getting that money that's coming in and this this might be fit into some of that monies. And uh, other than that, I'm thinking there are grants if if a school wants to write a grant or if they, you know, sometimes we have money earmarked and this would be just, an, we just want you to know that this is an opportunity and that Laura is actually going through this process and she thinks it's great, so. Yes. Yeah. And I would Pat. share along those lines, we priced it real affordable. It's. $799 for the entire series uh, for a year uh, per school building with a, with a 10% discount if the districts make a purchase. So it's you know, it's quite a bit less than you would spend to bring a speaker in just for one day. And I'll tell you, again, with my principal hat on, I don't think I could get through all six of the modules. I, it would be counterproductive to try to get through all six of the modules inside of an academic year. There's just so much content in there. Yeah. What that is really an amazing, amazing price, and thank you guys for making that affordable. Because um, I know you believe in the work, and you've seen the results, and it's changing lives, and that's what it's about. So I appreciate that. That price point is amazing and shocking. That's great. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Any last thoughts, last words before we go? I feel like a gypsy in the palace. Just happy to be here with you all and Greg. Uh, thanks for thanks for adding the fourth wheel to the mix. Oh, we're glad to have you. Yes, absolutely. And it's nice to meet you, Greg. Oh, thank you so and much. And you too, Eric. I just have heard about Greg. Well, sure. I, I'm not a household name in Alabama. That's for sure. I know. I mean, it's like he's <laughs> Washington, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Well, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you. And thank you, everyone out there, for all the good you do and the service you render. And, and uh, just know that we, we try, we're trying our best to have your back. I think that's what I'd like to close with. And, and whatever we can do to be of support, let us know. We're here for you. That was interesting. I know it. I mean, even the nuggets, oh, excuse me, kernels, kernels. that we got. Yeah. The and kernels that we got. So we got like five, so there are like 155 more, right? Yeah, but if you, yeah, but I'm so glad they gave us some really good ones that, you know, if our listeners just want to start, I love the four by four or the, yeah. you know, that was great. Yeah, I really, really liked it. So Kim, I have been dying for you to tell our listeners about one of our flights that we took this summer. <laughs> um when we were flying Flashing all over, is this the FBI flight or is this the, let's, let's save the FBI Homeland security because we okay. don't know, we don't want to thwart any missions, but just know <laughs> guys, there is a Homeland security uh, encounter that Kim and I had on one of our flights and it's, it's a great story. Oh but my God. I want you to tell today. You're, I want you the, the near uh, flight disaster yes it the was flight. almost our last flight ever it was it was ever I, it was a my my life our lives flashed before our eyes so laura and i did not get to sit together which was such a relief <laughs> like I, it was so, it was so nice to have some respite and so I don't know why it is that when we fly Southwestern, we are the last people on the plane every time. I know it's because you say it's when we go on and, and book or, or when we go on to whatever. 
Well, when you wake up and you say, oh, I think I need to check in and you do it like 30 minutes before our flight before takes off, you're the last gonna be, we are going to well, be in level C. Stop making me do it. You think ahead and you do it, but maybe I'm doing it subconsciously so I don't have to <laughs> sit with you. So anyway, we get on the flight and I, you know how when you sit, I'm in the middle, which I hate. I'm in the middle because I am the I am looking for somewhere to see it just anywhere. And it's full. And so I, you find with your tall perspective, your tree like body, you can look out and see the entire end of the plane, but I'm just like, you know, down on the ground crawling around trying to find a seat. So I am sitting between uh, this woman and this younger guy and Let me just say this younger guy was really hip. You know, I mean, he is like, um, he's got his pods in his ear and, you know, he's so cool looking. Do people say cool anymore? We've talked about this before. I don't know. And then I've got this woman to, he's on my right. She's next to the window and it is, I go in with my howdies. And how y'all and nobody is taking the back. <laughs> Airbuds isn't even taking an Airbud out. He's just looking at me like, mm, I am, I'm busy. And she is acting like she's asleep and will not respond to me. <laughs> so I take the hint eventually after I has your mom and them, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing. And that's really hard for a Southerner not to, how y'all doing? Nothing. <laughs> So I am in the sullen position, which, you know, that is just, well, nobody wants to talk to me. I'm in the middle sitting there and we're, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty long flight and uh, nobody has spoken the entire time. I am looking plaintively back to you puppy dog eyes to see if I can get you and you are the head that's sticking above the, <laughs> the only head sticking above all the seats and you, you know, look at me pitiful and I turn back around. I'm a giraffe. So, with my neck sticking up. Uh, you back. are. You're like the giraffe. And, and I'm getting along great with my my uh, riding mate. Oh, y'all just chittery chatting. Yeah. And uh, so my two had just, no, ain't having it. And so as we are coming in for landing, um, finally, if you will remember, let me take you back before we land. We, you know, when the, when the airplane misses the airport completely, it just drives on by like a you know <laughs> drive by and then you hear the rustle you know and then my partners if I may left and right begin to wrestle a bit you know like oh we missed there and I'm like I ain't talking to you now you know you wouldn't talk to me before I'm not gonna talk to you now you may but anyway you, I can hear the chatter again the little nervous chatter we missed there for what's going on you know and but that happens so it the the plane makes a couple of loops around and steal that nervous chatter and and then it comes in for the final landing, finally, right? So you hear this collective like sigh. So we're coming in for the landing, and you hear that landing gear drop. Which and is startling to some. It Sometimes is. I'm just, yeah. And so uh, we hit that runway going 600 mile an hour, and we skid down to where people were screaming like, ah, ah. we didn't just land. Like we, I would call it next to a crash landing and then a skid, skid, skid. It was like three it, crashes. It was like was. we are popping down the, well, let me tell you left and right got friendly in a second. <laughs> so we grass pounds and right AirPod begins to pray. And I, and he had turned it into an R-rated environment by dropping a couple of f bombs. Oh, every time we hit that, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and who said <laughs> your partner on the right when he starts turning it into an R-rated environment? You said, "Uh, uh-uh. uh." You held. Uh-huh, I remember that. Uh, uh-uh. uh. Uh-huh. No, no, this is not. We're not going out. out. We're, we're not, not going out with an f bomb. <laughs> we're not going out of this world with an f bomb. And so he agrees with me, and we just. We're holding hands, praying out loud, praying out loud. And then left, who has not said anything, the woman from the left, she goes, and I tell you what else we're going to do. 
when we land, now we're skidding this whole time. We oh, went back up in the air. We, we went back up, up in the, the air. air. So we're yes. back up. At, we are right. at and cruising said, altitude. When we land, we're going to hold our hands up. <laughs> and we are just going to hold our hands up and praise. And, and so we all three were in agreement. We made a pact. <laughs> After that we landed, it was all praise. And Now, listen. It was amazing how F Mom became evangelist. <laughs> it was amazing. So we did. We we come on back around. We we went back. We landed that thing just as smooth and true to her word. Left holds those hands up. I hold my hand up. Right's holding his AirPods. Got his hands up, and we are thank you, Lord, for landing this plane. And I mean, it was like we were giggling. And, you know, hugging. And, and I look back at you and you had this look on your face because everybody could see us. And you were like, what are y'all doing up there? <laughs> and now F-Bomb is leading a tent revival at your church this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, I'm telling you. But I had, it was a very... Very, it, and I have flown, uh, you know, quite a bit, and the, and I've had some really weird situations and scary situations. But I remember the man, in, the man in front of us said, and I am going to say I think he was a pilot. I'm just going to say that more than you think that because, yeah. and he said something was on the, something was on the um, landing on the what do you call that strip. Landing strip. When the, pilot, pilot? when the pilot came back on and said, uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, blah, 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 whatever, you know. Yeah. He, I believe turned around to you and said, what he wants to say is. Yes. Yes. He, he alluded to the fact that we had a near miss crash experience. Yes. And so when we landed, you know how there's two in the cockpit. One came out of that cockpit slamming Slam the door I out he went to let I would hate to have been on the receiving end of yep. what I should have said hey yes mom go with that <laughs> go with that pilot <laughs> somebody needs a good dressing down <laughs> so anyway yes I that gosh we can't go together anymore because it's just a too much if we had gone out of this world let me just say I it would have it would have been a good time. <laughs> if what we, a way to go together. If, absolutely. Absolutely. And I made them speak to me. So you <laughs> win. I won. I won. I won. Well, what a way to end this episode with our story of our near death experience. Just one of many flight stories and I'm saving Homeland Security because that <laughs> which is my favorite Homeland Security I can still laugh out loud over Homeland Security I cannot wait <laughs>